Think about it. <coughs> there is one particular case, okay, where where counter mode it has a significant advantage. Okay, so think about that. Uh, okay, so that's it. Block ciphers, different modes. I mean, that's the way they get used in practice. Um, all that stuff we've talked about so far, all the stuff in chapter two, everything in chapter uh, three so far, has to do with confidentiality, right? What is confidentiality again? What's the definition? No one else is allowed to read it. No unauthorized reading. Okay, nobody can read the data. We're hiding it, right? So nobody can read what's in there. Okay, what about integrity? What is integrity? Nobody can change the data without being detected. Well, we saw that people could change the data, right? Things like that cut and paste, right, with the, uh, with the ECB mode, or you could cook up examples very easily, even with the one-time pad. People could change the bits, and it would decrypt to something else, and you would have no way to know that it was incorrect. Okay, so, con so confidentiality and integrity are two different things, okay? You don't get integrity just by encrypting. Okay, you, we're going to have to do something else, okay, something more, all right? Okay, now, which is more important, confidentiality or integrity? Well, you know, you don't want people to see your, you know, secret credit card information as you send it over the internet, right? So confidentiality is obviously more important, right? Well, okay, you know, maybe you order, you know, one copy of my book. You don't want to accidentally order 100 copies of my book, right? Or 100 copies of a different, much more expensive book. Yeah, my book's a bargain, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you want the order to be correct, right? You want it to be received correctly. So integrity is critical as well, okay? They're both important. And in fact, surprisingly, in a lot of real-world applications, integrity is much more important than confidentiality. I mean, here, here's an example. So suppose you have uh, banks, right, and they transfer funds. So you have the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and they transfer $10 billion, right? I mean, it's probably public record that they transferred this money. So confidentiality is really not a big issue. But integrity is a big issue, right? You don't want to transfer $1 billion or $100 billion. You know, you want to get the amount right. You want to be sure it was received correctly. Um, so anyway, so uh, integrity, you know, in practice is really important. Okay, and this is crucial. You just really have to uh, realize that encryption, all that confidentiality stuff we talked about does not guarantee integrity. Okay? They're separate issues. Okay? And we've seen examples of that, okay. Uh, okay, so how do we get uh, integrity? Uh, there's going to be, in this class, at least three different ways that we can protect integrity. Okay, so the first method we'll talk about here is uh, to use a Mac. Not this kind of Mac, this kind of Mac. So, somebody pointed out that uh, in the book, I think the word Mac is used like in four different contexts. Okay. It's one of those overloaded terms here, but okay, anyway, Mac. Uh, the, here we mean message authentication code. Sometimes it's given as MIC, message integrity code, but we'll call it Mac. Okay, that's more common. Um, uh, so the good news is we already know how to do this, okay? If you can do CBC encryption, you can compute a Mac. It's exactly the same process, okay, to compute a Mac. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute, uh, we're going to, you know, to, to, to do this, first of all, we have to have a key. Okay, there's no getting around that. There's no free lunch. We have to have a key, shared key. So assuming we have the key, how do we protect the integrity? We compute... We just take the data and CBC encrypt it, just like we did with CBC encryption, except we just save the last block of ciphertext, okay? Okay, so now we've got that last block of ciphertext, and that's going to act as a check on the data to make sure that it's correct, all right? Okay, so for this example here, let's assume we're just interested in integrity. Let's forget about that confidentiality. So we don't even encrypt the data. Anybody can see it but we're just worried that it should, when they receive it, that it's correct. Okay, nobody can mess with it and go undetected. Okay, so here's, uh, here's the Mac calculation. Okay, suppose we have you know, capital N blocks of plain text here. We're using CBC encryption, so we need a key, and we also need a 
initialization vector. Okay, so we've got the ID, we've got the key here. Okay, so we just start encrypting like we would in CBC mode, and we take the very last ciphertext block we get, and we just call that Mac. Okay, that last block, we're going to send that along with the plain text. Okay, because again, we're just worried about integrity here. Uh, and what else does the receiver need to know? They have to know the key. They have to know, they re receive some plain text, they receive a Mac. What else do they need to know? They need the IV, okay, because the receiver, the sender just chose that at random, so you better tell them what it is. They can't, uh, can't do the process. Okay, so anyway, the receiver gets all this stuff. What's the receiver going to do then? You see that the How are they going to verify? After, uh, after the exact same way. Exact same thing. They're going to do exactly the same process. They're going to take whatever they receive and they're going to do the CDC encryption of it and make sure the computed MAC comes out to be the same as the received MAC. Okay, that's the objective here. Okay, so does this really work? I guess is the question. Well, okay, so let's look at an example and suppose we have four plain text blocks. Okay, P0, P1, P2, P3. So what does Alice do? She generates an IV. Well, first of all, Alice and Bob share a key, right? That's assumed in advance. So she generates a random IV, and she just starts encrypting using the CBC mode. So that's the formula, right? That's how you encrypt. Okay, and she's getting these quantities as she goes along, computing the next one. Whatever the last block that comes out here is, she calls that the Mac, all right? Now, what is she going to send to Bob? <laughs> She's going to send the IV. Bob has to know the IV. What the else? Ciphertext. No ciphertext. Plain text. Plain text. We're just worried about integrity here. We're not worried about coverage. Okay, so we just send the plain text and we send no. the Mac. Okay, so those six things, I guess, in this case. Okay, so Alice sends IV, P0, P1, P2, P3, and the Mac to Bob. That's what Bob receives. Okay, now let's suppose Trudy's in there and Trudy does something malicious. <coughs> Trudy can see the plain text, right? She doesn't want it to be a billion dollars. She wants it to be $10 billion. So she changes P1 to something else. Okay? Okay. Um, so what does Bob receive? Well, let's suppose everything else is correct. So Bob receives IV, he receives P0, he receives X, P2, P3, and the correct map. Okay, now what does Bob do? He computes the same, he goes through the same process here, right? Except with the data he received. Okay, so he takes the ID and he got P0 and ID correct. So he knows the key, so this comes out correct. Okay, now on the next step, he plugs in X, right? And that does not come out correct, right? So this is red C1 versus blue C1, which somebody pointed out doesn't show up very good when you print the slides in black and white. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, so red C1 there is not the same. Okay, now what happens? He uses the incorrect C1 in the next calculation, right? And so he's encrypting not the same thing here, so he's almost surely not getting the same thing out here, okay? So he's certainly not going to get the same value out for C2, or the same value out for C3, or the same value for the Mac. So, so he detects there's something wrong, right? So the Mac that he computes doesn't agree with the Mac that he receives. So he says there's something wrong with this data, I don't trust it, okay? The integrity is not there. What's really going on here? You know, I thought we said, you know, what's going on is that an error is snowball, is propagating through. Yeah, but I thought we said in CBC mode, errors don't propagate, right? What's going on? That's for decryption. That's right, okay. So this is encryption, right? So when you encrypt in CBC mode, the errors do propagate through. And when you decrypt in CBC mode, the errors don't propagate. That's great. That's exactly what we want. Okay. So it works not only for encryption, it works for, you know, for confidentiality, it works for integrity as well. Okay, so again, that's the crucial point. The errors propagate into the Mac. And you should be able to, you know, demonstrate something like that with a small case, right? Okay, show you what's going on there. Okay, now Trudy, no matter how smart she is, how clever she is, you know, there's no sort of 
obvious way here for her to change this value so it comes out correct, so it matches, right? I mean, what would Trudy like to do? She would like to change this to something and have the map come out the same, right? <coughs> There's no obvious way to do that unless Trudy knows the key. If she knows the key, then all bets are off. She can do lots of things, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, how about this? Um, so now we can do confidentiality lots of different ways, right? Stream ciphers, block ciphers, CBC mode, CTR mode, and we can do integrity with uh, this uh, MAC trick. Suppose we want both. We want uh, confidentiality and integrity, right? That's what happens a lot in practice. You want both. Okay, well, how do we get integrity again? We compute a MAC. How do we compute the MAC? CBC encryption, right? Well, you're doing the CBC encryption, you just encrypted the plain text, right? Why not send the cipher text and the MAC, right? Then you get both, right? You get confidentiality and you get integrity. Sounds good. But then you can get the key out of that. It's like a free lunch, right? Because you already did all that work to compute the cipher text, right? And you just send the MAC again. What does that mean? It means you, com you, you CBC encrypt everything, you send the cipher text, and then what's the MAC? The last block. So you send the last block twice and it's more secure, right? No, it just can't work, okay? There's no, there's no that free of a lunch, okay? It's just not going to happen. Okay, so you can actually do CDC encryption and compute the MAC, but you have to use different keys to do it, okay? Or you don't really gain anything, okay? You can actually use keys that are related to each other, you know, like one's just XOR some constant to the other key, even related in some known way. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, how did classically, how did people, you know, distribute keys and get these symmetric keys to the right people? Well, the U.S., just to take one example, you know, the U.S. Navy, you know, the military, they have a big problem distributing keys out, right? So the U.S. Navy, they used to have this guy called John Walker who worked for him, and he would uh, distribute keys out, and that was his job, right? So he would go to uh, walk somewhere in Washington, D.C., pick up the keys and distribute them to the, go to Norfolk, Virginia, and put them on the ships, you know, as they would show up. He had a little side business going. He would stop by the Soviet embassy on his way, and he would sell the keys. <laughs> and he did this, and his family did this for decades, actually for like 20 years before they were caught, right? So distributing, you know, so tr classically what you do, you take a trusted person, right? You, you know, put the keys in a briefcase and, you know, handcuff it to their wrist or whatever and then go deliver the keys. That's a very weak link in the whole system, right? Um, so uh, modern techniques involve like public key, key distribution systems and so on. We'll look at some of that, but it's still a problem, okay? For now... <laughs> We just assume somehow or another they shared a key that nobody else knows. Okay, so we haven't got into that yet. Uh, okay, any other questions? Uh, okay, so what do we use symmetric? Uh, we're basically done with chapter three. Okay, what do we use symmetric ciphers for? Uh, we use them for confidentiality. Okay, and you can kind of think of this in two different uh, flavors. You know, the techniques are the same, but kind of two slightly different uh, uses here. You may want to encrypt the data and send it to somebody, so over an insecure channel. Or you may want to just encrypt it on a, on a storage device, right? Like you encrypt your hard drive. Okay, so those are two slightly different uses. Uh, we can also use symmetric ciphers for integrity. Okay, we look at the Mac. Okay. Uh, we'll see later in uh, symmetric ciphers get used a lot in authentication protocols. And there's, a, you know, at a theoretical level, um, symmetric ciphers, hash functions, and I don't want to say, uh, anyway, symmetric ciphers, actually block ciphers, stream ciphers, and hash functions are at some level, they're, they're considered equivalent primitives. Okay, anything you can do with one, you can do with the others. Some of it would be really unnatural to do, <laughs> you know. So in practice, it's definitely worth it to have symmetric ciphers and block ciphers, stream ciphers, block ciphers, and hash functions as separate things. But in principle, you could just have one and you could accomplish every, everything you need to do. 